Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we're taking you through the best bits of Range by David Epstein, How Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. Man, this is one of my new faves. I actually read this twice in a five-week period just because I read it once, thought it was sick, and read it again. I didn't realize that. I didn't know it was one of your new faves of all time. That's uh, saying a lot. Maybe faves of all time is a stretch, but definitely, definitely very high up there. Favorite, one of the faves of the year, most definitely. The interesting thing on the front, it has a quote from Malcolm Gladwell, uh, who's the best-selling author of your, one of your other favorite books, Outliers. He says, it makes me thoroughly enjoy the experience of being told that everything I thought about something was wrong. I loved range. Mm-hmm. I mean, that says, a lot about, that says a lot about Gladwell just saying yeah. my book, Outliers, <laughs> which is wrong. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, two very different approaches and maybe in two very specific circumstances. But uh, he kicks off this with uh, two stories of two sporting icons of the world. And this was actually one that he said he was in a debate with Malcolm Gladwell. And this is one that he really got him with um, to go against Gladwell's 10,000 hours hockey Matthew effect practice like we've talked about. But the first story, you probably know this person at an early, early age when he was seven months old. His dad gave him a golf putter that was chopped down to size and he dragged it around. Before he could even walk, he was crawling around dragging this golf putter around. At 10 months old, he climbed down from his high chair and he went stood up and started swinging, practicing this swing that he'd seen his dad do in the garage. The boy couldn't even talk yet, so the dad drew him pictures as to where to put his hands on the golf club, how to hold it properly. At age two, most kids are probably maybe starting to walk a little bit and they're standing on tiptoes and they're experimenting with their legs and what they can do in this world. This kid's gone onto the national TV on the Bob Hope Show and he starts driving golf balls like (laughs) an exceptional exceptional range. This is a two-year-old kid. He can barely even talk yet, but he's driving golf balls. When he was two and a half, he entered the under 10s golf tournament and he won. So this is a pretty serious, crazy sort of a, uh, an early start to a career. At age three, he shot 48 for nine holes, which is just 11 over par. At age four, his dad used to take him, drop him off at the golf course at 9 a.m., go back and pick him up at 5 p.m. eight hours later after just practicing. At age eight, he beat his dad and then he started to win his first real adult tournaments. Mm. So if you haven't figured it out yet, we're talking about Tiger. Tiger Woods, absolute prodigy from the very start. I mean, I'd love to see that footage of him at two years old kicking ass to 10-year-olds. Have you seen it? No, is it a oh, real the, thing? The one that, where it was on TV is there, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was a bit of salt and pepper by it and a bit of no, creative no. freedom with David. But <laughs> the other pretty per- Yeah, okay. I said Google it, Tiger Woods, Bob Hope Show, yeah. All right, everyone Google that and check it out. Okay, so that's Tiger Woods. Now, we've got another person here. He's also a kid and he was a little bit different. At the age of two, he used to kick the ball around with his mother when he was playing around like most boys. And at the same age, he started playing squash with his father on Sundays. But then he also dabbled in skiing, wrestling, swimming, skateboarding, basketball, handball, tennis, table tennis, badminton over his neighbor's fence and even soccer at school. His specific sport didn't matter. He just loved playing different kind of sports. As long as he had a ball, he really enjoyed it. His mum was a coach, but she never really coached him. Uh, She tried to teach him how to play tennis, but really, she hated doing that. And he would try all different kind of shorts and different trick shots when he was playing around in tennis, but he'd never really return the ball normally, and he was really annoying to play with because he wasn't the best at the very start. But over time, he got pretty good at tennis, but his dad encouraged him to go out there and try a wide range of different sports and not only just do tennis. Even his tennis coach, he tried to move him up higher and higher age groups because he was developing quicker than all the other boys his age. But he told his mum he wanted to stay down because he wanted to stay with his friends and talk about music or play around with soccer and pro wrestling and all these kind of things rather than just go at tennis. So the person we're speaking about now, uh, Roger Federer. He was very late to commit to his late sport. It's a famous story that he could have been a world-famous soccer player and it wasn't until his mid-teens that he quit soccer to focus on tennis and eventually he became number one in the world for a man. I think he's one of the most opens. He's won the most Grand Slam finals in history. And even into his mid-30s, he was still ranked number one in the world. Even the Australian Open, the 2020 Australian Open, he uh, still made the semifinals. He's still ranked number three at this stage as well. So we're posing the question, out of these two different philosophies, whether it be very, very early specialization and going hard on that to accumulate tens of thousands of hours, as you would Malcolm Gladwell style, like Tiger Woods, or the other philosophy is trying many different things at the very start and then later choosing to specialize. So out of these two different circumstances, which one is the more optimal way to go? So the Tiger Woods approach, there's shitloads of books that you can read about it. 
It's all about getting an early head start, picking something as early as possible, committing to that path and going through this early specialization where you're doing deliberate practice, you're following the tried and true path to success, you're working one-on-one with a, a coach or a teacher or a trainer, they're giving you direct feedback, they're telling you specific drills, do this exact one thing over and over and over until you've got it perfect and then move on to the next one and get that one perfect. This is the tiger path of early specialization, deliberate practice to get to the point where you can become the best in the world at this one path to mastery. And the other path, what they're defining as the slow bakers. So for these late developers, they moved a lot across sports at the very start and they had a lot longer period at the very start of a sampling period until they found something that was a little bit closer to their proclivities and the things that they were more interested in. And then that's when they started their deliberate practice journey. So on one hand, you got the people doing it straight away and the other hand, you got people doing deliberate practice later down the track. So this Tiger versus Roger story became a a real famous one for the author David Ep... Is it Epstein or Epstein? (laughs) Epstein. Definitely one of the two. I just don't want to to get confused with the other guy with a similar name that's been in the news recently. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Completely unrelated. Also David Epstein. (laughs) Uh, Not David. Uh, What's his name? Jeff. Jeff Epstein. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if he wants to um, pronounce his name slightly differently. Uh, But anyway, he uh, did some digging. He thought, okay, well, obviously, Tiger is one example. Roger is one example. Are there other people that fit in either one of these? And just after this story he'd written was starting to gain some traction, the 2018 Super Bowl came around and the two quarterbacks on the you know the two stars of the opposing teams they didn't follow the tiger path at all you'd think that the two best quarterbacks in the world would be going through this early specialization head start deliberate practice but actually on one team you've got tom brady he actually got drafted as a professional baseballer in 1995 and it wasn't until 2000 that he switched across and got drafted as an nfl player and then on the other team, Nick Foles, he actually played in high school football, basketball, karate, and baseball. And then in college, he was forced to choose between either basketball or football. So it wasn't until his early 20s that he committed to playing football. There were loads of other examples as well he came across. He was watching the 2018 Winter Olympics where the Czech athlete Esther Ledeka became the first woman to win gold in two different sports at the same Olympics, being skiing and snowboarding. But as a kid, she played multiple sports and focused on school study, never ranking in number one in any of the teen competitions that she did. You've also got the Ukrainian boxer, uh, I'm going to butcher this, (laughs) Vasil Lomachenko. That wasn't too bad. bad. Uh, He set a record for the fewest fights needed to win a world title in three different divisions. But if you look at his teenage years, he took four years off from boxing to learn traditional dance as he thought he wanted to become a professional dancer instead of a boxer. He said, doing all these many sports as a kid, like gymnastics, dance, tennis, basketball, football, all came together to enhance his footwork as a boxer. So they're great examples of sporting stories. But for most people listening, uh, it might be too late or there's probably a very low chance that you're going to be a professional athlete. So thinking about, I guess, the world of work and the world of career, what's the best path? Is one path is getting the head start, picking early the specialization that you want to go down and focusing narrowly and deeply on this one area or the other path being one of breadth and range where you go through this sampling period of trying a whole bunch of different stuff and learning a wide variety of skills before later picking your one specialization that you want to go down. And there was actually research that posed this exact same question and had some results And it showed that the early career specialists have a big earnings advantage when they're straight out of college, as you'd kind of expect. But the late specialisers made up for this lack of a head start by finding work that better fit their skills and personalities, and then they took over them in earnings and seniority later in their careers. So I guess what they're saying here is, at the very start of your career, don't be so afraid of moving around and jumping around and quitting your job for a new industry, because... In the long run, in the infinite game, you're actually going to be better off if you just stayed in something that you were only uh, remotely or slightly excited about. I think it's pretty scary to make a big change because you're worried that people are so far ahead of you, you're not going to be able to catch up. All these people who have had the head start are just so far advanced in their career that you can never catch them or overtake them. Mark Zuckerberg famously said that young people are just smarter and saying that you know it's the best type of person to start a tech startup is a young person because they're smarter, they can work 
quicker, they can work more hours, they don't get tired as often. But of course, Mark Zuckerberg is a 22-year-old at this stage. He's getting Facebook ready for a massive IPO. So of course, that's a story he's going to tell. What the stats say is something completely different, that a 50-year-old who starts a tech startup is actually twice as likely to succeed as a 30-year-old. And a 30-year-old who starts a tech startup is far more likely to succeed than a 20-year-old. So it's not true at all that if you switch to something different or try something new and innovative and creative later in life that you've got no chance, you're actually probably more likely to succeed. So the core idea of this book is working out what is the best approach. Is it one of generalization or is it one of specialization? And he says that specialization is like the letter I in that you're going straight forward, you're keeping down this one path, you're going deeper and deeper and deeper down one particular niche. Whereas generalization is like a T, where if you draw the top first, you're starting out broad. Uh, it's probably trickier to work out what you're going to do. You've got so many different possible options ahead of you in different directions you could head down. And usually it's probably a matter of luck and some kind of opportunity rather than good planning. But eventually you find something that you really like and that's when you start to dig deeper and deeper and make the trunk of that T. David Epstein, he shows a bit of research here over a 15-year period. They looked at 32,000 new patents from 880 different organizations and they looked at their career trajectory of the person responsible for the patent. And obviously in the world of work, there's an ecosystem of jobs with different attributes. And they broke it down to low uncertainty fields versus high uncertainty fields. So in low uncertainty fields where there's less variation, less variance, less change going on, they found that the linear path of specialization were the types of people who came out with more and more of these patents. They found that the experienced specialists, they were usually the ones that were far better at creating the new ideas in these low uncertainty fields. But if you look at the high uncertainty fields, that's where there's a lot of variance. In these cases, most of the new creations were totally useless, but every now and then there was a few blockbusters. And in these fields, it was actually the people who had a very wide variety of past experiences that were able to bring together the intersection of all of their different range of ideas to come up with those blockbusters. So when venturing out into the uncertain world, it's actually the breadth of knowledge and experience that makes all the difference. So Epstein, he read more and more studies, spoke to more and more researchers and found more and more evidence of the same thing. It takes time, often foregoing the head start where you're going to fall behind all your peers to develop personal and professional range. But in the long run, over the span of a whole entire career, you're much better off doing it that way. The advantages of breadth and delayed specialization pertain to really every stage of life, from the development of children in math class, whether you're doing music, to sport, to students fresh out of college trying to find their way, even to mid-career professionals in need of change, and even to retirees looking for a new vocation after finishing their work careers. In each case, range is actually the better and more optimal decision. The challenge we face, of course, is how do we maintain the benefits of breadth, diverse experience, interdisciplinary thinking, and delayed concentration? There are probably some specific niches that you might head down that demand the hyper-specialization of the tiger approach, but in most cases, in the large majority of cases, we actually need people like Roger. We need people with range. He's got a story here of a pretty wild father, a Hungarian man, Laszlo Polgar, who was born straight after the Second World War. He had no grandparents, no uncles, nannies and cousins. They'd all been wiped out by the Holocaust. So he was, he was really starting with a fresh family and he wanted to just bring up the most successful and wild and most talented family he possibly could. And I think his style was probably a little bit similar to the way I'd try and bring up a family before uh, reading what the results <laughs> of all this was. But he had a few kids uh, the first one popped out, her name was Susan, and he thought, all right, we're going to make Susan one of the best chess players of all time. So at the age of two, they started Pawn Wars and started training up for chess. At age four, after eight months of training, he took the daughter to the Smoky Chess Club, uh, playing chess with the older 40, 50-year-old greybeards. And then at the age of four, she entered tournaments with all the 11-year-olds and kicked all of their asses. Then he had two more daughters and similar story for them. They were both homeschooled and by the age of six, they were writing and reading and doing math at years beyond their age level. A normal day for them consisted of playing table tennis at the gym with trainers from 7 a.m. Then by 10 a.m., they'd be home and ready for a long day of more chess training. In his spare time, he digitized 200,000 records from the chess journals and built his own database. 
This was before the chess tournament, so he gave this to them as a part of their research about the most advanced system and largest chess database in the world. So Laszlo, he decided that the traditional education system was broken. He decided to use his own method to turn them into geniuses, and a, a big part of his philosophy was this early head start. And he's saying that if you gave any child any head start in any area, they they can eventually become the best of the world in this area. And so in the world of chess, it worked out pretty well because uh, when his kids were 19, 14, and 12, they formed three of the four members of the Hungarian national chess team. Uh, and they beat the Soviet Union, which was a team that had won the past 11 tournaments in a row. At age 21, Susan became the first female grandmaster. At age 15, Judith became the youngest grandmaster ever. So in the world of chess, uh, they did really, really well. None of them got to his eventual goal of being the best in the world, but one of them got as high as eighth overall, and they were winning all the women's chess tournaments. So I guess the experiment had legs in a sort and he was saying that, you know, if you gave other people the same advantages, the same head start, maybe they could cure AIDS, maybe they could find a cure for cancer if you Mm. got them started on the right track early. But the big assumption here is that chess is a good representation of any skill that you want to learn in the world. It makes a lot of sense. It comes from the same philosophy of your Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours. If you really specialize early, you get that head start you're going to get the benefits from the Matthew effect and more and more opportunities are going to come to you, meaning you do more and more practice and then eventually you're the best in the world at what you do. The big drawback of this line of thinking though is that it works really well for some areas. He says things like chess, things like poker, even things like firefighting, they benefit greatly from narrow experience. But there's so many things out there in the world that do not benefit from this method of training. Things like predicting the financial markets, analyzing political trends, Uh, assessing employee performance. There are so many things out in the world that do not follow these same methods where deliberate practice and narrow experience make you the best in the world. Yeah, he differentiates between two kinds of environment, like a kind environment and a wicked environment. You got golf, which is a very kind environment. So the Tiger style of early specialization is very suited to something like golf. You got tennis, which is Rogers Field. It's a bit more of a wicked environment and there's a lot more variables in there and skills from other sports might serve you well in tennis. But the real world where all of us work in, it's a lot more like Martian tennis. You can see the court and you can see people holding a ball, but you really, you've got no idea what the real rules are, no idea exactly what strategies will work, and no idea what to practice in order to get better and achieve the success. So the kind worlds, that's where specialized practice works. Things like golf, you want to do the exact same thing over and over and over. It's one repeated skill where you want as little variation as possible. If you tilt your wrist two degrees either side, you're going to have a vastly different experience. So in those fields, specialized practice where you're going deep is the way to succeed. But in the wicked world, the real world around us, we don't really know what the path to success is. We don't know which things are going to work. And Epstein says that in the wicked world where we've got ill-defined challenges and we don't have any rigid rules, then range is what he calls a life hack. I'll pull something out just on the fly now. I think, say, if you're doing university and you're studying for engineering, you're really predicting somewhat of a kind environment where all you do is structural computations one day. But you really, you never train for that moment where in a meeting, a mechanical service person just puts a big hole through your big structural beam that holds up the whole entire building. (laughs) Sounds like a familiar example. Oh, it comes up all the time. (laughs) But at university, not trained up for that moment. That's just something out of the blue. And really the real skill comes from the person who can negotiate that experience and not the kind environment skills that you learn at university. Yeah, I like it. I think I remember you telling me about that... uh that story just we're not going to go there mate about the building that's going to come down that i might be liable to <laughs> uh, cut that <laughs> <laughs> if we look at chess as an analogy to go even further into this chess can be broken down into tactics and strategies so tactics they're the short combination of moves where players get an immediate advantage on the board, whereas strategy, that's the bigger picture planning. That's managing all of the little battles in order to win the war. So tactics are the short-term areas that really benefit from specialized knowledge and from a head start. The tactics are the types of repeated tasks that you can do over and over and over, and that's where deliberate practice refining with low variance makes it beneficial. Whereas strategy, on the other hand, that's bigger picture planning. Strategy doesn't benefit from a head start and strategy doesn't 
benefit from small deliberate practice. Strategy actually benefits from a wide range of understandings and looking at things from the bigger picture and looking at it from different angles. So we've got strategies and we've got tactics. I guess two different skill sets we've got, but what's going to be the best one to have going forward in the future? If you look at tactics, these are the skills that are best adapted to specialization, the rules and the tasks that are somewhat predictable. Computers have started really automating these kind of things. They learned how to beat chess about 10 or 15 years ago. They can beat every human player in the world in this specialized field with the rules well known. And this is the exact same kind of thing that computers are going to be able to automate more and more with the closed rules. But the tasks that require somewhat of strategy, these are more in the human domain and are much more difficult for a computer to automate. If I go back to that structural engineering analogy, the engineering side of things you learn, if you learn at university, there's basically a set of 10 to 20 different computations you have to do for every single element. You can see clearly it's just a matter of time before the computer can actually embed that within the architectural software, architect move the beam, and then everything else does the design and sums up itself. And it's already heading in that direction. Whereas the computer will never be able to speak to that mechanical engineer and negotiate uh, what's the, gonna be the best solution for the project overall. Okay, so we've hung some shit on uh, Outliers and Malcolm Gladwell, one of my top 10 books of 2018. Now it's time to hang some shit on one of my top 10 books of 2019, yeah. Grit by Angela Duckworth. Yeah. Grit spawned this whole idea that you, know, you, you need to stick to tasks and use your grit to just push through the tough times. And uh, if you stick at something long enough, you can get really, really good. Uh, and uh, it turns out that maybe having too much grit is actually a bad thing. Yeah, I think both of us were very happy to see this because uh, <laughs> yeah. Angela Duckworth, she's got the grit scale where she asks a wide range of questions, questions like, I don't give up easily, I'm a hard worker, I overcome setbacks to conquer important challenges, and there's a wide variety of those kind of questions, and you give yourself a score, and me and you we did very poorly on it. Yeah, I, at the time I was... It's a bit it's disappointed like, in ourselves at the yeah. time, but after reading this, yeah. I'm pretty happy with it. Well, it is like it's just a questionnaire of 10 questions that you answer yourself based on what you think. So, it's pretty easy to manipulate to get a high grit score mm. if you wanted to. But uh, she said that the big study that this was related to was this uh, West Point Beast Barracks for training uh, new military people. And these were like the best of the best. They got in using something called the whole candidate score. The whole candidate score took in their high school test scores, their physical fitness, their demonstrated leadership abilities and ranked everybody and they took the best of the best. But Duckworth found that the whole candidate score didn't actually predict who was going to do well and who was going to drop out. And so she found that the grit score predicted which people would stick through this grueling training period and which people were going to quit halfway through. So if they scored high on this grit score, it's showing that perseverance is very high in them and they're not going to quit at any cost and they're going to push hard through this and they're not going to just change interests, wake up and just move on and become a barista the next week. But Epstein challenged some of these ideas and that is saying that sometimes like not quitting and not changing interests, these are not necessarily things that should be highly valued. He goes through a whole range of people like Vincent van Gogh and JK Rowling and a whole range of different people who he called late specializers. These are people that flip-flopped around and floated from job to job and career to career. And it wasn't until later in life that they committed to something and stuck through it. Mm. So I guess if Vincent van Gogh and J.K. Rowling, if they were at 10 out of 10 on the grit scale, then they'd probably just stay in their first profession and then never wander out until they found something that suited them much better. An important factor he found was something called match quality. And this is what economists use to describe the degree of fit between the work somebody does and the type of person they are, like what are their abilities and what are their interests. So what Epstein is saying is that grit, if you've got a high grit, it means you're going to pick something and stick to it. But what he's saying is that these flip-floppers and these floaters, they move around from job to job, from career to career. They sample a whole bunch of different things and it isn't until later in life that they specialize once they've found something that matches their quality. I guess if you go the, the grit path, you pick something and stick to it, you've got a chance that maybe it matches exactly what you wanted to do and that's great, but there's a very, very, very high chance that it's not what you want to do and later you end up quitting. 
Whereas the floating method of late specialization means once you pick something, commit to it, there's a much better chance that through this match quality, you're going to be finding something that you enjoy doing and something that you're good at. So the two benefits we're weighing up here is one, you got the increased match quality by not having too much grit, moving around a bit at the very start to find something that's more suitable to you. But obviously, this is going to come at the cost of early skills at the very start. One study they found here was actually within the British school system and college system. He found that countries in England and Wales that had specialized university degrees like science or law or economics and that dictated the subjects people picked in high school. So it means at sort of age 15 or 16, you're picking the career that you want to have later in life. You're doing those subjects in school, you're getting that degree and you start work in that field. Whereas in Scotland, a country extremely similar and extremely close by, they actually had a two-year period at the start of college where it was compulsory to do a wide range of generalist subjects before picking what you wanted to do. So what they found was that the England and Wales people that actually quit their jobs and shifted to something completely different later in life, whereas the people from Scotland, because they had waited before they picked something that they wanted to do, they quit much less often. So whilst we might think that getting a head start is a good thing, there was actually a higher likelihood that if we quit, we'd lose all of those advantages of the head start and try again. So it was actually better to delay that choice and float around first before picking what we want to specialize in. So learning stuff in college is probably less important than just learning about who you are and the things that you really want for the rest of your life. It's like being told to choose your long-term life partner at the age of 16. At the time, it might seem like a great idea to go out and marry your childhood sweetheart, but over time you learn more about yourself and she learns more about herself and you learn about each other. You might realize that you made the mistake of early specialization if you, if you decided to marry. Now, let's go back to the research of grit. We were talking about the beast barracks where the most hardcore of the hardcore possible soldiers you can find and they were picking the best of the best and they used the grit scale to figure out who are the ones who are going to stick through. And I guess implicit in the book Grit, it is the most successful people were the ones who stuck through it and then went to the very end. But we're really missing the other thing. What about the people if they quit? Perhaps they made the right decision. Mm. Perhaps in quitting early, they weren't meant to be soldiers and if they persevered and went the way through in the long run, they're not going to be as successful as they were if they quit and then pursued that different career path that was better suited to their match quality. It would be pretty tough to expect an 18, 19, 20-year-old who's entering this field to know that this is exactly what they want to do and that quitting means that they're just, they were too weak to cop it. What it probably is a better indicator of is that finding out more information and finding a better match quality. They really don't know what they're getting themselves into. So maybe they get into it, they do the first week, it's pretty tough, but maybe it's just not suited for them. So maybe they found out this information is saying, this is not the life I want to sign up for, so they're going to quit and go off to do something else. Seth Godin talks about a similar thing in his book, The Dip. He says that winners never quit and quitters never win is horrible and bad advice. He says that winners quit all the time. They just quit what's not working and they quit the right stuff at the right time. So switching and quitting something isn't necessarily a failure of perseverance. It's just realizing that there might be a better option out there that's available. Switching is actually a pretty good strategy, whether you're an early specializer or a late specializer. You might think that by switching, you're losing all of the skills and knowledge and advantages that you've built up and you've got to start again but you actually learn a lot quicker than the second time around. So your rate of improvement is a lot quicker. So you can make up for some of the, the, that lost head start. One analogy that I liked, you're in a casino, you don't know which pokey machine is going to pay out. And so rather than just picking one pokey machine, sitting down and playing it and waiting for that payout, you're actually going to sample a whole bunch of different machines first, get a bit more information about them before you pick which one you're going to sit down at. I guess the analogy has got a little bit of depth, but... <laughs> Asha, you got you, you can get pretty hooked on gambling easily and you'd, you'd probably actually try that in a real casino, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd try which pokies are going to pay out the most. But the I'd sample them all. <laughs> the philosophy is there. You might as well trial out of different things and then after you've trialed it out, you've got a better idea of what's going to actually be the most promising long term. One other interesting thing about the author specifically, he, I think he was actually a geologist. He was studying rocks before he got into writing and journalism. He was giving a speech at a college and some of the students said, hey, I want to become a, a journalist just like you. I want, want to work for Sports Illustrated. What degree should I do? Should I do a degree in literature or should I do a degree in journalism? And uh, Epstein actually said, it's probably not 
either of them. It's probably something like biology, so you can learn about how athletes function at their highest, or maybe it's about statistics, so you can trawl through years and years of data and come up with interesting stories. Like the writing part of it can sort of take care of itself, but if you've got a strong grounding in something completely different, you can write some pretty interesting stories later on. So in summary of all that, in the wider world of work, finding a goal with high match quality is really the greatest challenge to success. And persistence for just simply the sake of persistence and having grit, it can really get in the way of finding it in the first place. So there is a big risk if you've got a high grit score. So in summary, if you've been working your career a while and you get an opportunity that's a little bit left of field and it's something that interests you and excites you, don't be too hesitant to switch in between fields. There'll be a lot of people out there who say you're better off specialising and staying where you are and you've climbed this mountain because you climbed it, you're going to sacrifice all this hard work you've already done. In reality, over time, if you do the shift and as a career philosophy, you find better match quality, in the long run, you're going to be much better off than just specialising way too early. There's a small number of paths that you can go down in which a head start, early specialization and deliberate practice are going to be vital to success. But the vast, 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 vast majority of the world today is actually going to be less dependent on how deep your knowledge is, but how broad your knowledge is. What different ideas can you bring and find the intersection and make new innovative ideas that come together based on your experience from a wide range of different things. And I think I re the reason I like this so much is because I've followed the range path, <laughs> not, the, <laughs> not the specialist path. I, you know, as a kid, as a nine times national gold medals for swimming, oh, yeah. uh, state footy team, but then studied physiotherapy and then changed over, studied finance and economics, worked at a bank, worked in logistics, worked mm. in marketing. Um, so I think that's, Full that's confirmed my self-opinion. Self -opinion. <laughs> Low grit scale, plus <laughs> all that. Low grit, no 10,000 hours, just full range, full doing range, different shits. Just bouncing around. So all I can hope is <laughs> when I hit 50 that it all converges somewhere. Well, so David was right and not Gladwell, <laughs> so I'm the same boat as you, kind of. We've read a hell of a lot of good books for this podcast and what we've done is we've compiled our top 50 favorite books, what we call our top 50 best books of all time. We've ranked them from number 50 all the way to number one. We've given a paragraph or two of the best bits that you can expect from that book and you can check it all out for free by heading to whatyouwilllearn.com slash top 50. That's whatyouwilllearn.com slash T-O-P-5-0.